straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. Another Minnesota police officer facing criminal charges for the death of an unarmed man. Officer Kim Potter booked into jail on second degree manslaughter charges for fatally shooting Duante Wright. Plus, the defense of Derek Chauvin goes into its second day with a former medical examiner saying Chauvin did not kill George Floyd. I would fall back to undetermined. And arrest made in the disappearance of a California college student more than two decades ago. The tips that led to charges against Kristen Smart's former classmate. I'm confident that we have enough of a case to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Law and Crime Daily, covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Ross in our studios in New York with Brian Buckmeyer on assignment in Minneapolis for the trial of Derek Chauvin and with us as always our colleague Terry Austin. Big news out of Minnesota with a police officer charged with second degree manslaughter for the shooting death of a young man. But first to our coverage of the Derek Chauvin trial and Brian Buckmeyer is here with the latest on the case being made by the defense. Brian. Yeah, Brian Ross. So Eric Nelson asked, as any defense attorney would, for what's called a directed verdict, basically saying that in the light most favorable to the prosecution, they haven't made out the elements or the charges that are being faced by Derek Chauvin. Now, Eric Nelson pointed out to the fact that two of the witnesses for use of force, given the example of Lieutenant Zimmerman and Chief Arredondo, their testimony was similar, but it seemed to contradict that of the other witness, Professor Stoughton, in terms of his use of force and when and where that use of force was inappropriate. The judge ultimately decided that the status or the um, level by which the defense was asking it should be dismissed beyond a reasonable doubt was inappropriate, that the standard is in the light most favorable to the prosecution, and that the, de that the defense was incorrect in stating that the jury can kind of pick and choose what information they want to reach that ultimate conclusion. And so the judge denied that motion and allowed the jury to make a decision for guilt or innocence. Brian. Okay, thanks, Brian. Maurice Hall, the suspected drug dealer who was with George Floyd the night he died, will not testify. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here to explain why Hall thinks he could face charges. Anjanette? Brian, Maurice Hall was arrested during jury selection on unrelated charges. He may not, he is not going to testify in the Chauvin trial. He won't be required to do so, but his legal troubles could be just beginning. I'm right here, Paul. All right. All right. Here. I appreciate that, man. The video doesn't lie. Maurice Hall was clearly in Cup Foods with George Floyd last May and then in the SUV. Hall's lawyer says that is why he can't answer questions put forward by Derek Chauvin's defense. Why would you not answer those? I'm fearful of criminal charges going forward. I have open charges that's not settled yet of my personal stuff. Chauvin's defense has suggested Hall caused Floyd's death by giving drugs that led to an overdose. Hall's lawyer believes his testimony could lead to him facing charges, including drug possession. Mr. Hall cannot put himself in that car with Mr. Floyd. Again, this was a car that was searched twice and drugs were recovered twice. Let's say Mr. Chauvin is then acquitted. He has now given the state on a silver platter testimony to use against him in a third degree murder charge if they decide to bring it. Hennepin County's medical examiner, Dr. Andrew Baker, ruled Floyd's death a homicide due to being restrained by law enforcement. But he also called Floyd's death multifactorial, stating Floyd's heart disease and drug use were contributing factors. Judge Cahill had the final word on whether the jury would hear from Maurice Hall. I had earlier said that possibly he could talk about how Mr. Floyd looked in the car, but counsel's argument is persuasive that that could provide a link. And since it's not just evidence that would incriminate a person, but also provide a link to incriminating evidence. I do find that his invocation of his Fifth Amendment rights is valid. Now, Judge Cahill, based on all of that, ended up quashing the subpoena for Maurice Hall, meaning he basically made it go away. Hall is currently free on bail and will be back in court in Hennepin County in June. Brian? Thanks, Anjanette. And when the jury was finally brought in, they heard from a forensic pathologist hired by the defense who provided a set of findings that sharply contradicted everything that's been heard before about the cause of George Floyd's death. So in my opinion, Mr. Floyd had a sudden cardiac arrhythmia or cardiac arrhythmia due to 
his atherosclerotic and hypertensive heart disease during his restraint and subdued by the police or restrained by the police. Um, and then his significant contributory conditions would be, since I've already put the heart disease in part one, he would have the toxicology, the fentanyl and methamphetamine, exposure to a vehicle exhaust, so potentially carbon monoxide poisoning, or at least an effect from increased carbon monoxide in his bloodstream, and paraganglionoma, or the other natural disease process that he has. So um, all of those combined to cause Mr. Floyd's death. Terry Austin, most of Dr. Fuller's testimony contradicted pretty sharply the medical experts thus far. What was your opinion about his testimony, especially on carbon monoxide? Brian, I have to wonder why Eric Nelson is raising the issue of carbon monoxide. I mean, we might as well throw in the kitchen sink. The prosecution did not raise that issue. And he himself, Dr. Fowler, said that he's not suggesting that Floyd died from carbon monoxide. There was no test for carbon monoxide. And yet they went on and on. They talked about the CDC. They talked about the EPA. They talked about the WHO. Why are we talking about these levels of carbon monoxide when it is not even an issue? I think it's irrelevant, and I think it's confusing, and I don't think he added any value to the defense. And Brian Buckmeyer, how do you think Dr. Fowler held up on cross-examination by the prosecution? So the crush has been kind of interesting. I would have thought it would have been a little bit more heavy-handed and a little bit quicker, but it appears that the cross-examination is slowly going after each and every detail uh, by this uh, this witness, and also uh, also attacking some of his findings and where he's getting these findings. We're hearing that he didn't fully research one or two issues that came up, and also that he's not a pulmonologist. So a lot of what he's talking about in terms of the lack of breathing or the lack of oxygen, he's not really an expert in. So it really begs the question, why did you put this witness on? The only thing I can think of is to muddle the waters so that everyone is so confused they just end up trying to compromise. I don't know if that's going to work for the defense, though. All right. Thanks, Brian. Still Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, Derek Chauvin's defense team calls their use of force expert to the stand. But was his testimony enough to sway the jury? Plus, the officer who shot Dante Wright now charged with his death. What that means for the city of Brooklyn Center and the state of Minnesota. Day two of Derek Chauvin's defense case and what has to be called a battle of the experts. Brian Buckmeyer is back with us now to talk about their use of force expert. Brian? That's right, Brian. The defense called veteran police instructor Barry Brode, who was able to testify and said that the actions of Derek Chauvin were justified. I felt that Derek Chauvin was justified and was acting with objective reasonableness following Minneapolis Police Department policy and current standards of law enforcement and his interactions with Mr. Floyd. Barry brought as a retired police officer with nearly 30 years of experience. He's reviewed more than 140 cases, testifying in 10, including on behalf of the defense of former Chicago police officer Jason Van Dyke in the shooting death of Laquan McDonald. Broad used a tape measure to show 13 feet between him and Van Dyke's attorney and then rushed the attorney. I'll show you much time you would have to react to me. Yes, 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 yes. Broad says he reached out to the city of Minneapolis when he first saw the video of George Floyd's death. You were ultimately not retained by the city attorney's office or the state, correct? That's correct. You then were retained by my office? Yes. Broad says he's reviewed videos, witness statements, and use of force policy. So it's easy to sit and judge in an office on an officer's conduct. Broad gave his opinion on what he called Chauvin's first use of force when he joined officers King and Lane to try to get Floyd into the back of the police vehicle. I felt that that level of resistance exhibited by Mr. Floyd justified the officers in higher levels use of force that they chose not to select. Did the use of force then continue after uh, Mr. Floyd was restrained on the ground? I don't consider a prone control as a use of force. Broad says the officers were objectively reasonable in bringing Floyd to the ground. If the officer was justified in using the prone control, 
and now the suspect is on the ground in a prone control, the maintaining of the prone control to me is not a use of force. Why is it not a use of force? Because it's a control technique. Without, it, it doesn't hurt. Um, you've put the suspect in a position where it's safe for you, the officer, safe for them, the suspect. And Broad says the growing crowd size became an additional threat to the officers. I could see that Officer Chauvin's focus started to move from Mr. Floyd to the crowd. To one point, I think Officer Chauvin felt threatened enough that he withdrew his pepper spray canister and gave verbal commands to the crowd to stay back. So now he's dealing with the bigger threat. Prosecutor Steve Slesher then cross-examined Broad for more than an hour and a half. If you believe that it is unlikely that orienting yourself on top of a person on the pavement with both legs is unlikely to produce pain? It could. What do you mean it could? Is it unlikely to produce pain or is it likely to produce pain? I'm saying it could. At any time, do you recall noting Mr. Floyd saying, my neck hurts? I heard it. I didn't necessarily note it. Because your, your testimony was premised on this not being a use of force because there was no pain involved, right? Yes. But you didn't note that? No. Fact? Slusher played the body cam video, stopping to analyze each portion of it. What part of this is not compliant? So I see his arm position. A compliant person would have both their hands in the small of their back and just be resting comfortably versus like he's still moving around. Did you say resting comfortably? Or laying comfortably? Resting comfortably on the pavement. Yes. At this point in time when he's attempting to breathe by shoving his shoulder into the pavement. I was describing what the signs of a perfectly compliant person would be. Mr. Floyd doesn't appear to be conscious at the end of this clip, does he? I can't tell. He's not resisting. He's not talking. It's not possible, is it? To do what? Resist. I think it's definitely possible to resist. When you just... passed out. He's not doing it here, is he? Not when he's passed out, no. Brian, the pool report suggested some jurors were actually nodding off during the defense case. Are Eric Nelson's uh, experts making any inroads? I don't think so, especially in this line of cross-examination. Brian, let me put it this way. I get it. I'm a public defender. I do what Eric Nelson does as well. But before I put an argument out there, I make sure it passes what I call the laugh test. I ask my mother, my father, my friends. I've asked Terry. I've asked you. Does this make sense? Is this something that a jury is going to not only understand, but also accredit if I say, I don't think Eric Nelson ran this line of questioning through the laugh test. And I think he's should be happy that they're falling asleep and not laughing at him as they're asking questions like, oh, compliance is laying there with your hands resting on the small of your back. I don't think it passed the laugh test. I don't think it made sense. And Terry Austin, the use of force expert Barry Broad talked a lot about what constitutes use of force in the broader context. Do you think he was familiar with the Minneapolis Police Department definition of use of force? Obviously not. I don't think so, Brian, because he was saying that using prone control did not constitute use of force because it didn't inflict pain. But we know for a fact that that's contrary to Minneapolis police policy, which definitely says that this type of restraint does constitute use of force. And you heard there on the clip that if it's on the concrete, that if he's in handcuffs, if there's manipulation of the hands, that in fact all of that could cause pain. So ultimately, he did admit that all of this together could be use of force. So I don't think he was very effective for the defense. I think the prosecution did a great job in making sure that what happened to George Floyd was use of force. All right, thanks, Terry. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, what led to the arrest of two men in the murder two decades ago of college student Kristen Smart? Plus, the death of 20-year-old Dante Wright, the officer who shot him, has now been arrested. What's next in the investigation? Next, a major development in the shooting death of a young man just miles up the road from the Derek Chauvin trial. Law and Crime's Kim Johnson is here with the latest in the Dante Rice case. Kim? 
Yeah, Brian, Kim Potter, the former Brooklyn Center police officer accused of shooting and killing 20-year-old Dante Wright, has been arrested and charged with second-degree manslaughter. That is a charge that carries up to 10 years in prison. Now, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension is handling the investigation and booked the 26-year police veteran into the Hennepin County Jail. On Tuesday, she resigned from the police department along with police chief Tim Gannon, who called Sunday's shooting during a traffic stop an accident when Potter mistook her gun for a taser. Now, attorney Ben Crump has been retained by the Wright family, and in a statement, he said that while we appreciate the district attorney pursuing justice for Dante, no conviction gives the Wright family uh, or their loved one back, and he goes on to call the shooting intentional and deliberate and said that Potter should have known the difference between a taser and a firearm. Brian. All right, Kim. The prosecution in this case seems to have moved very quickly without even going to a grand jury before bringing charges. Yeah, in fact, this entire case has moved quickly. If you think about it, it was Sunday that the shooting took place in the afternoon. By Tuesday, the officer and police chief resigned and the city manager had been fired. And a day later, charges and an arrest had been brought. Again, though, the family have been calling for this case to move quickly. The community wanting justice. All right. Thanks, Kim. Kim Johnson in Minneapolis. When we come back. Two arrests made in the decades-old disappearance of college student Kristen Smart. The new leads in her case, next. Two men have been arrested in connection with the 1996 disappearance and suspected murder of Kristen Smart. Smart was a 19-year-old student at Cal Poly State University when she vanished more than 20 years ago. Investigators say they always suspected ex-classmate Paul Flores, who walked Smart home from a party when she was last seen. New evidence surfaced in 2016 that police say links Flores to her murder. In 2019, her case was spotlighted by the podcast Your Own Backyard. Investigators then interviewed several witnesses for the first time. The San Luis Obispo Sheriff says... They were able to search Flores' cell phone and homes of his family members. In February of 2020, detectives served search warrants at the home of Paul Flores, as well as his sister, mother, and father, all simultaneously um, last year. Physical evidence recovered during these searches led to the service of additional search warrant at Paul Flores' residence in April of last year. During the search warrant, detectives recovered evidence related to the, the murder of Kristen Smart. In March of this year, detectives served another search warrant in Arroyo Grande uh, at the home of Ruben Flores, the father of Paul Flores. Additional evidence related to the Smart invest investigation was discovered that, at that time. So as a result of this evidence, a San Luis Obispo Superior Court judge signed two arrest warrants and two additional search warrants. Paul Flores has now been arrested and is charged with murder. His father, Ruben Flores, was also arrested and is charged with accessory to murder. Smart's body has not yet been recovered, but the sheriff says he's hopeful. We're after all kinds of things, physical evidence again, anything, uh, anything that might lead us to the location of Kristen. Um, and as you know from the previous search and, and as you reported from this search, we're out there with, you know, our ground penetrating radar again. So, yes, it's, it's safe to say we're, we're checking everywhere possible. Forensic physical evidence was located. And, yes, we believe it's, it's linked to Kristen. Um, and, yes, we did find physical evidence at, uh, at at least two homes. So, Brian Buckmeyer, a very cold case, but they never dropped it over 24 years. Yeah, this is one of those cases where we're seeing, Brian, the determination of the police force and not giving up just because um, some leads may be cold 
or because there is not enough evidence. Now, my curiosity is going to be, what is this evidence that led them to an arrest after 20 years? I think that's what's on everyone's mind and what everyone's thinking of, especially the defense attorney who's going to be hired for this case. You better believe that argument of, well, this case went cold for 20 years is going to be brought up in that person's defense. Without a doubt. And Terry, the authorities, as Brian said, have found additional physical evidence, but they still have not located a body. So how difficult to convict someone without the body of the victim? You know, Brian, it's difficult, but it has been done. The prosecution is going to have to rely on circumstantial evidence. And it has been said that it's sort of like running a 100-meter race and giving the other side a 40-meter start so that it's very difficult to catch up. But here, we heard that there was some forensic evidence. And what I'm thinking is perhaps there were remnants of blood. Perhaps there was digital evidence. Perhaps they have witnesses, and maybe they've done electronic searches. So perhaps they can put all of that together. And it did sound like they hope that eventually they will even find the body. But without the body, they can still proceed forward, and they could possibly get a conviction. And you know what else, Brian? We know it's been done in the past. It was done with Jeffrey Dahmer, and we know the Durst case is going forward even without a body and or could go forward as far as his ex-wife is concerned. So it's been done, and it looks like it will be done in the future again. And, Brian, certainly the advances in DNA science are important here. Yeah, DNA is going to be a huge part of this case because, there, like you said, there is no body recovered. So you've got to at least make this case a strong circumstantial evidence case. And DNA is going to be that. Of course, DNA doesn't prove that someone handled something specifically or that they were uh, they used that object or were there. But it does create that circumstantial evidence because their DNA was found there and make a strong case for the prosecution. All right, Brian and Terry, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.